Okay, welcome to lecture 12. We're going to talk about reinforcement theory and hiring and firing this week. Okay, first a little bit of housekeeping. Discussion 10 is due uh, this Sunday, as well as a team activity. And please remember assignment three, believe it or not, is coming up. Uh, we'll be due in three weeks to um, April 24th. This week, we're going to cover reinforcement theory. And we'll discuss how in many ways you have much more power to influence things around you than you realize. And then we'll talk about uh, the popular topic of hiring and the least popular topic, firing. Okay, so let's talk about reinforcement theory. The key to reinforcement theory is to understand that uh, living things, all living things, for the most part, respond to rewards. That is, if you think about why do you do things, why do we take actions, uh, the reason is because we have learned that certain actions achieve certain results. So uh, throughout the literature, the research has been consistent that reinforcement, in fact, is much more powerful than punishment. So let's start with the, um, the top uh, cell, and row, and column. So the top line there, the top row, is encouraged behavior. So if you apply reinforcement, uh, then you will get a strengthened behavior. So in this case, uh, typical reinforcements are uh, extra attention, praise, and money. The good news is that, in fact, uh, extra attention uh, and praise, uh, or attention and praise, are some of the most powerful human motivators uh, possible. So, uh, and both of those are free. So, in fact, you have, uh, or we all have, quite a bit of power in terms of how we provide attention to people and how we provide praise. Um, we'll discuss more about that in just a second. And of course money uh, it truly makes the world go around and allows us uh, to uh, survive and eat and so on and so forth. Um, the next, uh, go, uh, going to the right uh, under withhold reinforcement, so the next uh, thing that encourages behavior is removing punishment. Uh, or what we call negative reinforcement, which just means that uh, you will do something so so as not to get admonished or penalized, uh, and that quote unquote again encourages behavior. So uh, doing your homework so that um, you will not get lectured or have to do you know extra dishes, uh, uh, working hard because you're afraid of getting fired, um, uh, doing your coursework. Uh, because you want uh, to get a good grade, or which would be in the first cell, or doing your coursework because you're afraid of uh, getting a bad grade, which would be, again, that punishment. So let's go to discouraged behavior, which is the bottom row, um, and start with punishment. Uh, so punishment, uh, we're all familiar with that, uh, are negative consequences. So in this case, uh, uh, reprimands, um, Ignoring completely, which is, I know, a little bit odd, but basically meaning that you punish someone by ignoring them or not providing them any attention. Uh, and uh, certainly criticism uh, is another one spanking, of course, for, for children. Um, <clears throat> but the thing about punishment is that uh, it creates what we call no -um behavior. Uh, and what, what no -um behavior means is that... Um, and I'm going to provide you with the link in just a second. Research has shown that, in fact, both uh, reinforcement and the avoidance of punishment are equally powerful. Uh, and so once you punish someone, uh, on one hand, um, it's designed to strengthen behavior. And research has found that, in fact, it does strengthen behavior, um, but only if the punishment is exerted every single time. So, and that's what uh, what we call the introduction of no CM behavior. Now, perfect example is uh, how many of you speed, and I'm sure most of you are raising your hands uh, at the computer because we all do. Uh, and the answer is why? Well, it's because we want to get where we're going quicker. 
Uh, and uh, although we know it's against the law, and although we're afraid of getting a ticket, uh, the um, the positive getting to where we want to go quicker or not wasting our time on the road um, is uh, more powerful uh, than um, getting a ticket uh, or breaking the law. Now, the other aspect, however, is that, in fact, it's no CM behavior, which that there's a certain delight. Uh, and again, uh, I'll show you this research in a second, preliminary research, uh, that uh, of doing something we're not supposed to do. Uh, and again, the brain research is showing that, in fact, the exact same pleasure regions are, um, are turned on uh, if we get reinforced uh, reward, positive rewards, or uh, we're practicing no CM behavior where we're doing something we're not supposed to do. Um, and then the last one uh, is under uh, withhold reinforcement that column, second cell extinction. So the way, the way to extinguish behavior, uh, like I had said at the very beginning, is to essentially ignore uh, or uh, deprive um, actions with any feedback whatsoever. So as I, said, as I said at the beginning of the slide, ultimately we do things because we have received positive consequences or we do things to avoid negative consequences. But if we do things and we get absolutely no feedback at all about it having any impact at all, uh, then that uh, behavior will eventually become what we call extinguished or extinct. Um, <clears throat> so some examples uh, within the workforce would be consistently ignoring uh, both good and bad uh, employees and their behaviors. Um, no pay raises, uh, so uh, hopefully outside of uh, uh, positive or no, or hopefully you will be still providing at least positive uh, reinforcement through praise and recognition. Uh, but no pay raises uh, certainly uh, starts to extinguish uh, behavior in the sense of why does it matter? It doesn't matter if I work hard or not. Uh, I'm not going to get paid uh, anymore. Now, um, on one hand, that can seem crass, but again, remember basic reinforcement is positive signs and rewards that are tangible and meaningful. And certainly praise and attention are, very, are the most powerful. But in the end, as we discussed before, uh, getting no pay, pay raises becomes a punishment uh, in the end because of inflation. So, um, and again, no nothing. That is, uh, if you really want to extinguish a behavior, uh, then you give absolutely no feedback whatsoever. Now, that red arrow there uh, really illustrates again the point that uh, punishment. Uh, is is very valuable in its own right because it allows you to uh, provide uh, negative reinforcement. Which again, the speeding uh, we see police when we see police we slow down, and so we're negatively reinforced for slowing down because we don't get a ticket, right? Um, and so, uh, so punishment is necessary, um, and uh, in small dosages. So. Uh, let's let's look at really the analogy of of the carrot and the stick. Uh, it's my opinion that it, absolutely you need both. Uh, with much more carrot, a much bigger carrot, and a much smaller stick. Um, the thing about reinforcement, positive reinforcement, is that it shows um, the person or thing or animal or whatever uh, the right way to do things. That is, you show them what you want to to have happen. Now, again, remember in our discussion with first break all the rules and raving fans, uh, we're talking about not um, uh, process as far as uh, not being, uh, you know, uh, uh, rigid processes, but, in, but instead outcomes. So show them what outcomes you want to see achieved, what it looks like, what it feels like, uh, you know, just give it a give it a much clearer view as far uh, as far as what you want to have accomplished, uh, and then um, <clears throat> reward accordingly. So remember, if you uh, want um, behavior to be strengthened, uh, you reward, uh, and uh, again, or the most most positive way to strengthen is to reward. So uh, set clear goals uh, and then reward uh, consistently, uh, and again, understanding that praise and attention. Um, are some of the most powerful uh, reinforcers. Now the stick, however, is that uh, you establish those goals, you, you, you um, lavish the praise and attention uh, when it's done, 
Uh, and then you also have that stick at the very end when when it's absolutely not getting done, and that can be in the form of a, just simply a discussion uh, where you're admonishing them, uh, and of course uh, firing and is, is the worst case uh, scenario. So, so really, carrot and the stick, uh, and take a look at this article. It talks about really, again, it's the same as far as uh, stimulating the medial uh, orbitofrontal cortex. So. Um, Reinforcement theory, uh, again, final word, uh, at least on this slide, carrot, big carrot, little stick, with the understanding that your your attention and praise are the most powerful things in your repertoire and use them uh, uh, carefully. And we'll discuss uh, this much more in the next few slides. Okay, so let's apply re re reinforcement theory and organizational behavior. So as an employee, coworker, or boss, what can you do? How can you apply this? Well, be positive. Be sure to remember when you're around other people, if you're positive, almost always, uh, you are essentially reinforcing and rewarding people, uh, again, in a positive way. So you become a positive influence. So, for example, compliment others. Uh, and obviously compliment others when not... not uh, 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 f in a fake way, but in a genuine way. But when you see things to be complimented, do so. Again, that reinforces that behavior. Uh, so you compliment others on behaviors that you want to see more of. Listen and pay attention. Again, attention is one of the more powerful rewards. So if you're listening to people, uh, especially when they're saying things, again, that you feel are important or meaningful, then you are rewarding them. Help others out. Um, <clears throat> when people are, are in need, uh, and you are able to help them out, again, that's a very a positive uh, thing. And again, you're rewarding people for turning to you. Um, be a voice of stability and reason. So certainly within groups, it's, not, it's never easy. Uh, but hopefully um, throughout this course, you're, you're building a, a clearer picture that uh, when, when things get messed up and people get tense, hopefully you can be the voice of reason uh, and stability as far as not allowing the emotionality to take control. Uh, manage up. Uh, that's a term we use to to interact with our bosses by rewarding them for doing the things you like. Again, uh, um, everything from complimenting them to attention uh, to your body language. Um, <clears throat> you can actually, I don't want to say control, but you can actually influence how your boss interacts with you uh, based on uh, your body language and the, your attention and things that you say. Uh, in the sense that you want you want all of that when they are treating you the way you want to be treated, and you want none of that when they're not treating you uh, the way you want to be treated. So, and again, um, the uh, the proximity between control and manipulation is very close. Uh, I'm certainly not suggesting you manipulate people. Again, manipulation is really uh, when you're you're controlling them. Uh, in a way that hurts them and helps you, and we certainly don't want to do that. But control is a better word, or manage is a better word, and that you can actually influence other people's behavior if you pay attention uh, to these uh, to these things. So, how do you punish? Again, ignore, voice disapproval. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so in this case, uh, if, if you're a boss or a coworker, uh, voices approval that addresses uh, behaviors uh, that may not be a good fit to the organization. Uh, again, ignoring only works so far if the person uh, is being reinforced or being rewarded by performing an enjoyable behavior. Uh, so, but certainly you can punish by, by your disapproval uh, and or ignoring uh, altogether. And the negative, uh, don't punish when they're doing something you approve of. Uh, so again, the idea that you don't admonish uh, when um, when uh, they're doing things the right way. Now, <clears throat> the key to punishment and negative reinforcement is that that's why you, we, we say pick and choose your battles, and that's why uh, you want to not be criticizing and lecturing too often. Uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, if you... If you are critical and are lecturing someone or some people uh, too often, then ultimately they tune you out. Uh, and again, it doesn't practice the, um, the 
the concept of negative reinforcement, which is move, removing punishment. So if you nag and complain and criticize too often, uh, then you're never giving um, the, the people that you're doing this to uh, that negative reinforcement, which is a removal of that. So that's why you want to pick and choose your battles. Uh, you want to be very careful with your criticism uh, and try not to make it too frequent. Uh, and then also flip it around. We call it catching people doing well. Uh, you want to, um, if, if you can think about decreasing behavior and increasing behavior, uh, people are just not going to change at a word. Uh, so you want to, again, um, although you see a number of, of instances where you can criticize, you want to minimize the criticism, um, ignore a few, uh, many of them, uh, and then um, reward uh, with attention and praise uh, lavishly uh, when you do quote unquote catch them doing uh, something, although not very often, uh, uh, the way you want it to. And again, remember, give attention in, instead of ignoring. Uh, so uh, both in school uh, and in organizations, this is a classic problem where you ignore those that are doing really well because it's our sense that they don't need our help uh, or want our help uh, or attention. And therefore, you leave them alone to do their thing so you can, you can work with other people that need your attention or help. And again, uh, that, is, that is one of the rules that need to be broken from first break all the rules. Uh, again, uh, think about it. Uh, all of you uh, that are in a graduate program can be considered high performers. Uh, do you need attention uh, and praise? Do you, need, do you want good grades? And the answer is yes, yes, yes. Uh, and so um, think of it that way. In the work environment, although people seem to not need any help at all, uh, all top performers need to know that they are doing uh, a good job. Uh, and again, what it means is that so uh, practicing the platinum rule, everybody has different attention thresholds and, and have different ways of wanting to be reinforced or rewarded. Uh, so you have to find what works with people, but find something because ultimately we all want uh, and need that attention, reward, and praise. And then remember the uh, concept of extinguishing. If you really want something to go away, then you ignore it completely. So it doesn't matter whether they're good or bad. Uh, no matter what they do, you're, they're not going to get your attention. Uh, and so oftentimes they just stop trying. And again, within the um, within the positive side or the top workers, that really is very painful because you're essentially uh, forcing them to the middle as far as being the average or below average uh, employee because uh, nothing they do gets uh, gets rewarded. Uh, and then on the flip side, unfortunately, it doesn't work so well for those that are, are really not doing well uh, because it's avoiding work that's positive to them. And so ignoring it usually doesn't work either. Uh, and the uh, rule of thumb is that if you really want to extinguish something, uh, allow it to occur 10 times without any behavior, I mean any reinforcement or feedback, and you will extinguish that behavior. Okay, continuing on with our discussion. So what do you do with top performers? Well, as first break all the rules says, you spend more time with them. And you're spending more time with them uh, by itself provides them that attention and recognition that you really approve of what they're doing and do more of it, please. As we discussed, be careful not to ignore consistently and fall into the trap of uh, they don't need my help, therefore I'm going to go to someone that does. Uh, because again, that's not the real dynamic. The real dynamic is um, you want to spend a, a, you want to spend a lot of your time rewarding them uh, so that they know that you want them to continue and, and, and get stronger in what they're doing. So low performing, again, remember the carrot and stick. That uh, is the most powerful combination. So the carrot is praise, clear goals, improvements, uh, and the stick is uh, a combination of ignoring uh, or criticism uh, and admonishment, but again, in small dosages, small stick, big carrot, much more frequent in terms of reward uh, and praise. So how does this work uh, with policies? Well, then you can see the same issue, lean and mean. 
So again, policies uh, in terms of positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, punishment are the same way. So if you're constantly, if you have too many policies, uh, you're constantly criticizing and admonishing uh, your employees for doing things that you don't want them to do, although in the end you're missing the big picture uh, that they are doing a lot of great things for, for you and the organization, but you're not. Uh, you have too many policies to worry about that. You just focus on the, the, the instances where uh, they are breaking policies. So you want your policies to be lean and mean because if you find yourself criticizing anything or anybody too often, um, that is going to uh, essentially break the whole system. Meaning that as we talked about last week, and pol policies are not reinforced or or um, backed up, then the whole system breaks down. So you want your policies lean and mean. You want them. You want to only have enough that you can monitor, uh, you know, on a frequent basis. Uh, ones that you are willing to admonish people on, um, but also uh, few and far between enough so that people can actually adhere to them. Uh, you know, with again a more positive outcome because there are not too many to to have to worry about. Uh, and then the other aspect of uh, policies is, again, um, let's not forget about the internal and external employees. Uh, obviously, most of this is focused on the ex internal employees, but really you want these policies to, of course, be linked to your external employees as far as um, how it will positively um, uh, benefit them, again, through the same concepts of reward and attention uh, in meeting your bottom lines. Same issue with um, negative uh, uh, reinforcement punishment. Uh, you want to minimize, of course, those interactions with your customers. Therefore, again, you want to minimize the number of policies that you want them to have to follow. Otherwise, again, you're increasing the likelihood that you will, in fact, be uh, punishing them for breaking a rule. Um, <clears throat> salaries and benefits. Um, so you know, that goes without saying that salaries and benefits uh, are the, one of the more tangible rewards, uh, letting people know uh, that they are uh, doing a great job and tangibly reinforcing them for that. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is that uh, oftentimes benefits can be more powerful than salaries. So if you can't give them a raise, you can still leverage your time, your paid time, with some flexibility uh, to reward them. So whether it be longer lunch breaks, uh, uh, fun retreats, um, take the day off, uh, whatever, uh, there are ways in which to reward them. Now, of course, that's going to work for so long. And the basic saying is that salaries and benefits are are less of a motivator are, as they are a demotivator. And what that means is that people that love their job don't need to be paid the best. Uh, they just don't need to be paid the worst, uh, meaning that uh, as long as uh, you're not the um, lowest on the totem pole as far as salary and benefits, uh, you'll, most people that enjoy love their jobs will feel fine with that because, again, you're not in it for that. Uh, but at the same time, if you feel like you are undervalued, then that becomes insulting. So remember, uh, the salaries and benefits uh, ultimately is not uh, the primary motivator for most of us, but it certainly is a demotivator uh, if if we find that it is um, much uh, t much too different than other people. Okay, this is uh, where we usually do the hot and cold uh, reinforcement demonstration. And imagine this: what we do is we place uh, a piece of candy or some other reinforcer. Uh, somewhere in the room, uh, we choose a couple people and have them, obviously before we do that, uh, leave the room. Uh, and we've all played hot and cold probably where one, one at a time they come in uh, and we say nothing uh, and we clap as they get closer uh, and we don't clap as they move farther away from the target. Uh, and uh, by uh, our own cultural expectations and values, people immediately pick up on the fact that clapping is a sign of praise. Uh, and so therefore, as we clap louder, uh, that is, they're getting hotter, uh, then they uh, automatically gravitate towards the reward and candy. Uh, and it always works and is a perfect demonstration uh, and analogy or metaphor for 
how powerful reward and reinforcement uh, are. Uh, and again, in that exercise, if we didn't we didn't clap at all, then they would be completely lost and have and and be meandering around looking for the can candy uh, or reward aimlessly. So. In the end, it's a reminder that positive reinforcement guides people to the behavior you want. Negative reinforcement or lack, uh, negative reinforcement or lack thereof, uh, tend to let them know uh, that they're not on the right track. But again, think about it: the different the, the the positive reinforcement rewards show them what you want them to do. The punishment um, uh, shows them what you don't want them to do. And if so, if you're primarily a punisher, you're spending most of your time focusing on what? On what you don't want them to do. Uh, when in fact, hopefully all that you've been reading and thinking about in, in your interviews with your administrators focus on the reverse, which is you want to focus constantly on what you want them to accomplish and reward accordingly. Okay, so let's talk about hiring. So as first break all rule says, you want to hire for talent. And I know, although that's a bit vague, ultimately what they mean is that uh, those, uh, if, again, as they define talent as a recurring set of behaviors, thoughts, and beliefs, uh, you want them to be able to um, tell you with some degree of conviction and passion uh, what they're good at uh, or what they would do in specific situations. Let me be the first one to tell you that uh, although you know this, you're part of the group that understands this, most still do not hire for talent. They hire for other things. So how do you know what you need? Um, how do you know what talent you need? <clears throat> Good way to look at it is what are the primary top five job tasks of this position? Uh, and then as you had gone through the types of talents, uh, which ones are the more, the most important that you're looking for. Um, <clears throat> one of the issues always is personality versus credentials. Um, credentials, of course, are what most people fall in love with. A resume, um, uh, where they graduated from, the degrees they had, places they worked. Um, but certainly personality is actually a very, uh, also, So let's talk about the process of hiring. So from the perspective of the, of the hiring um, organization, who should be on the committee? Um, <clears throat> and the answer really is it should never be top down. Uh, it, should it should be a representative group of people that will be working with this individual, peers, uh, and, and certainly other departments. Uh, and it's, it's important because therefore, um, <clears throat> the employees that will be working with that person uh, have buy-in uh, in, because they help select the individual. On the flip side, if, if they do not, it's certainly le less likely to end up positively uh, because um, either one, they don't mesh very well, or two, uh, the employees that have no say in it uh, are resentful and treat the person poorly. You also want to make sure you work with HR from the beginning and complete necessary forms. Um, of course, they will give you things that you can't say uh, and again, and, and help you just make sure that you're doing things you need to do. There's always uh, an inside preferred employee, um, <clears throat> usually, uh, and, and that's always a good thing, but uh, be careful, and I've made this mistake before, do not promise. Uh, anything and to not also overly uh, bias or um, influence the process. So um, uh, in the end, uh, the employee that you love or that you really think would be perfect for the position and probably would be um, is, is uh, something that's very attractive. However, you never know what's out there. Uh, and uh, I've been in a number of cases where uh, the person that I really would like to get the position um, 
uh, you know, we, we, we looked at it as an inside hire, but then the quality of people that applied was pretty staggering and really uh, in a, at a whole different higher level, and those individuals ended up getting the position. So remember, a diverse gene pool should always be considered. Uh, that's also the thing to remember is that it's very easy to become too insular. You want to see what else is out there. Uh, and again, that increases what we'd say your the diversity of your gene pool because people of uh, you know different uh, backgrounds uh, from different regions of the country or the world, uh, gender, race, you know, you name it. Those are all very important things. So. For example, universities, you may be aware that there's the five-year rule, which is that after you get your PhD, you're really not allowed to work at that university as a, as a, as a teacher or instructor, um, <clears throat> at least on the tenure track, uh, you, have, you must go elsewhere. And so what you'll find is that your faculty are from all over the country. Uh, and not just from your backyard. And of course, the reason why that's so valuable is because, so for example, uh, here at uh, UNCG, uh, we have people from the north. Uh, we were led by someone from from California and from Canada. Uh, we have people from the south, uh, and we have people from the Midwest. So the bottom line is uh, we have a very good uh, r diverse representation on the faculty, which really should make you feel good uh, as far as getting uh, quite a good uh, brushstroke, broad brushstroke uh, of different uh, perspectives and values. And as far as hiring the contact person on the announcement should always be HR because ultimately there will be a lot of phone calls and emails and you don't want to have to do that because uh, that w that's all you'll be doing if you're not careful. All right, so <clears throat> after a set deadline, closing uh, deadline, you want to re review resumes. And if you're in charge of it, what you want to do is create packets for each one of your team members so that they can review those. Um, as much as it pains me, uh, still this is very much a hard copy process, even though email and electronic resumes are more and more common. Um, now, what you want to remember, uh, and this is something we're going to talk about in just a second, is that so imagine uh, a bunch of resumes in a stack going out to four, five, eight people, uh, and each one of those members uh, having to review <clears throat> those piles and come to a meeting with the in and out pile. So as you can imagine, um, all of these individuals have their full-time jobs uh, and certainly will do this examination, but in varying degrees of time and speed. And so now you see uh, the value of having a good cover letter because the people are not going to be spending that much time with any one resume. And in fact, they're looking for any excuse to uh, create an out pile. <clears throat> uh, also, the evaluation could be either open, that is, uh, each individual can use their own discretion or have a rubric. And I found rubrics to be more valuable because you'll find that the, the reliability and consistency amongst evaluators will be similar as opposed to open. Uh, then people are using different criteria uh, to evaluate uh, uh, candidates, and that usually causes a lot of confusion. <clears throat> Makeup your, of your interview team is also very important because it can get contentious, especially when people start falling in love with uh, uh, certain candidates. Uh, so uh, make sure that the interview team that's put together well, is one that works well together and is uh, uh, representative of the people uh, that can get the job done. All right, so let's talk about some, some of the things that you might be looking for as far as your top candidates. Dues, education as a prerequisite, personality fit and cover letter and experiences. So I'm a big passion person, and that is imagine, uh, go back to the word talent to cover the concept of talent, a recurring uh, set of thoughts uh, and behaviors. Uh, and so in that cover letter, you want to essentially um, demonstrate that. 
uh, that uh, you you do have experience or you do have pa and or have passion uh, for the type of things that this job is going to be doing. <coughs> Uh, and again, listing skills that are a good fit. Uh, and keep in mind, too, that these skills and experience do not have to be paid. It's just that you've had them. And then you can talk about them with a degree of clarity and passion. <clears throat> also, good fit. Uh, so it's important to hire someone that's not quote unquote overqualified or quote unquote underqualified. Uh, and it's someone that uh, will hopefully stay with you in the long haul. Um, I know that uh, one of the issues that we had uh, with the hiring of Beth Martin, outstanding individual, was that uh, she uh, is in a, a PhD program and uh, most likely will leave us once she gets her PhD. So uh, there was some concern there as far as the longevity of her tenure um, you know, with, with our uh, program. But uh, ultimately, because of uh, the outstanding individual that she is, uh, we will take what we can get. And then again, go back to talents, remember what you're looking for, and does the cover letter and resume speak to the talent that you, you need? Also, in terms of references, uh, it's also important to not just uh, go uh, by their supervisors. Uh, you can use the grapevine as well, uh, informally, and people do Google, so keep that in mind. Uh, both as far as if you're hiring or looking for a position, people will Google uh, to check check up on what's out there. Uh, another thing uh, is that if the if the candidate is not listing their supervisor, uh, that always is a potential red flag um, because uh, you know ultimately um, that is the person that you want to talk to or get a feel from. Uh, about how uh, this employee is so be be uh, be weary if you don't see uh, a supervisor listed as a, a job reference uh, or their immediate supervisor uh, because again that 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 could suggest potential problems don't don't fall completely in love with a degree university hometown or experience Meaning that if they're from your university or they have uh, these these wonderful degrees, uh, they're from your hometown, um, or just are tremendously experienced, none of those are uh, by themselves uh, enough or really what you want. So think about if you um, hire someone from your same university or hometown, on one hand that's great, but on the other hand, um, <clears throat> is that really the criteria uh, as far as hiring for talent that you're looking for. So if that becomes a single variable, ultimately it will probably become a mess. <clears throat> also, in terms of, uh, uh, actually this is really a do, not a don't, but you do want to allow leeway of others like others, and then that is, uh, as a good team member, uh, don't uh, don't practice the my, my way or the highway type approach when negotiating on who uh, ultimately will be the final candidate. And again, that's important for the uh, overall functionality of the team. And this is the interview team, that is. All right, who makes the interview round? <clears throat> The committee discusses and comes to consensus usually about the top two to five candidates. Um, and the reason why only two to five is imagine the uh, degree of time it takes to bring together five to eight people who have to step out of their jobs uh, to actually meet with the individual for an hour um, or so uh, and then repeat that for each other candidate. And so you can see that if you make the interview round, you're one of the final few candidates. Um, and so that's a good thing. Uh, and then on the flip side, you know, if you're on the hiring side, uh, you only want to do your top few candidates uh, because otherwise it's, you're, it just will be too much and you're, you will not be able to get your full committee together. The good news is that usually the, the most outstanding individuals rise to the top. Uh, and uh, you know, again, you've got to get yourself a good interview committee if that fact happens. Um, <clears throat> Follow-up questions via email also uh, are are very uh, very are just fine, um, especially for 
uh, work examples. So case in point, um, a couple years ago we were hiring for a web developer and uh, we were down to two, the two finalists that we interviewed. Uh, one uh, gave a horrible interview, was not personable whatsoever, um, but uh, had really good work product. <clears throat> the other person blew us out of the water, very articulate, uh, very uh, professional, um, <clears throat> uh, but did not show us a lot of work product. So we followed up uh, by email at my request to get some more um, uh, examples of her work uh, and in fact I remember during the interview she said it was down for some reason and so that's why I followed up by email to say okay well you know please you know send it to us when it's up uh, and she did uh, and it was really really bad uh, and so we ended up going with the non-personable person uh, primarily because uh, as a web developer uh, certainly the quality of your web design and development uh, outweighs, uh, you know, the the uh, the quietness or um, maybe not not as social uh, because bottom line is we're not going to be spending that much time with the web developer. So as far as the interview itself, it's getting to know the person, so the look and feel of the person, how they sound, uh, how they interact. You want to try to have the same questions for each candidate to keep it fair. Uh, clarification questions, of course, during the interview are perfectly allowable. You know, taking it uh, based on how the uh, interview is going. <clears throat> Again, allow a leeway if others like um, uh, certain candidates or, or want to pursue certain lines of questioning. So interview don'ts, and of course the H your HR department will have these. You don't want to talk about age, sexuality, or marital status. Or as you don't want to ask about those things, it's illegal. And really you want to avoid any personal questions outside of what is on the job application or resume. First break all the rules. They suggest open-ended questions, which again are very excellent because you, there are no prompts there. So you ask an open-ended question and just listen. Uh, and looking for those uncomfortable silences uh, and seeing how the candidate handles those. <clears throat> uh, first break rule also says a talent interview uh, should stand alone, as it could be like a second interview or an extension of the first, uh, where um, there are specific questions focused on the talents that you're looking for and looking for tangible reasons or examples. Uh, and again, passionate, articulate, tangible examples. That is, the, the uh, although the interview candidate will be nervous, uh, if it uh, takes that much heavy lifting to be able to articulate uh, responses to certain talents, then uh, it may be that they um, don't really have them or are not as strong. Um, Yes, or not strong enough so that they can articulate them in a pressure situation. Also remember the chit chat uh, before and after is a big part uh, of the interview. Um, a, a famous study uh, that I saw um, on Discovery Channel a couple years back uh, took four interview panels or four panels of people from four, uh, different regions of the country and they watched a video of four different candidates uh, and all four of them chose the same candidate that ultimately was actually offered the job um, <clears throat> because of the following because of their uh, their when they first met the interview panel they were smiling they gave a firm, firm shake, uh, handshake uh, and basically their nonverbal communication uh, was extremely positive and confident um, now What's interesting about that is that, in fact, uh, what it suggested is that ultimately, given all other things relatively equal, first impressions are huge. Uh, and so um, the idea of a, a smile and a handshake and good eye contact, that was the other thing, good eye contact uh, could be um, almost, uh, uh, you know, guaranteeing that you get the job, that would be too strong, but certainly helps. 
Um, to remember, uh, doing a tour is a great way to see how the chemistry is. That allows you to spend a little more time chit-chatting uh, with the person that you're interviewing. Okay, let's talk a little about the interview itself, uh, or let's talk about it uh, as far as the interview process uh, being on the other end as the candidate rather than the hiring committee. <clears throat> let's talk about your cover letter and resume. So uh, clearly your cover letter, and we're going to talk much more specifically about this uh, next week, uh, should have uh, the, uh, the golden paragraphs, and the golden paragraphs are uh, introducing um, the first paragraph, uh, what uh, position you're you're interviewing for. The second paragraph, talking about um, uh, how uh, you are ideally suited uh, for the position. Um, well, I'll take the back. The second paragraph are the the, the background and skills that uh, make you a good fit for the position. The third paragraph was the passion with some specific examples uh, for uh, experiences that are relevant to the position. And then the fourth one is thanking them and hoping to be able to talk to them more, um, uh, talking to talk to them in the future more exhaustively about why you think you're a good fit. Remember, the cover letter should accentuate your best fit qualities. Uh, so try not try not to give them everything, but give them the you know the things that are best aligned uh, with the job you're applying for. Certainly have people review and revise it, because um, <clears throat> if you look about it, if you think about it, it's the most important paper you you have to you ever have to write. Uh, so have people react to it. Uh, and also, which I, my opinion should reflect who you really are. Um, so, remember, this is a two-way street. Uh, so, definitely have um, a strong sense of self in that cover letter, so that they know um, uh, they get a sense of who you are. Because if ultimately, uh, they don't gravitate towards that, then it's, it truly is not a good fit. Um, talking to the HR person is always a good idea. Uh, I remember one person that I hired who uh, probably did the best that uh, uh, best that uh, I've ever seen. Uh, he uh, talked to HR and myself by email and voicemail about his interest for the position uh, and sent an email uh, as well. Uh, and <clears throat> I remember when uh, I was reviewing the stacks of, uh, of candidates um, that uh, I initially had put this individual in the out pile. But um, I, uh, I print, had printed out his email and part of my information packet, and I remembered uh, out of respect for his efforts to, to go and see whether he was in the in or out pile. Uh, and ultimately, he was in the out pile. And so I moved him into the in pile uh, to, uh, to, to, to give him a chance. Uh, and after reviewing it a second time, realizing that uh, he 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 really did belong more in the in pile. Anyway, he ultimately got the job. So it's it's a case in point of placing a, a name with a piece of paper, uh, and that's always a good thing. <clears throat> know the approximate timetable in which they're looking to hire, and remember you're never out of it until you get the rejection letter. Uh, oftentimes, what happens is that the first candidate. Um, uh, may not accept the offer and then they move down to the second um, uh, candidate. Uh, I, when, I was, uh, when I came out with my uh, degree, uh, I ended up having uh, three job offers. Uh, one of them was um, uh, the University of British Columbia where I was the second candidate. And apparently the first candidate turned it down and as they were coming to me to offer the job, I turned it down to accept the position at UNC Greensboro. So, um, uh, so that that's a case in point of how ultimately it was not a good fit for me to go up to Vancouver, uh, but uh, they were going to offer me the job uh, after they had uh, been turned down by the first candidate.
Okay, so as far as the interview itself, you get an interview, congratulations, you are now in the top two or three for the position. Uh, my suggestions arrive at the location at least 20 minutes before your interview. If it's big enough or the area is unfamiliar enough, you may want to even go the night before to scope it out so you know where it's at. Uh, and then you can kind of evaluate the parking situation. Uh, and the reason why I suggest that you arrive at least 20 minutes before your interview is so that you can relax. Uh, you know how always whenever we're in a hurry, uh, the slowest person on earth drives in front of us. Uh, you can account for that. Uh, and again, more importantly, you can you can freshen up when you get there, uh, and you can kind of just again relax before the actual interview. Uh, there's nothing like uh, being late uh, or afraid of being late to really again add a, a level of anxiety that you don't want present just before you meet these folks. So try to be there at least 20 minutes. And I said at least because again you you're going to have to way traffic and parking and all these other things and so you want to err on the side of being there way early so that you can relax <clears throat> again make sure you can find a place and that traffic is not a problem or if it is to account for it <clears throat> again allows you time to relax and freshen up it also allows you to observe employees in the surroundings. So interviews are definitely a two-way street. Uh, you're interviewing them as well. Uh, and so just sitting in the lobby and just listening and watching is also a very good thing. Um, look at the employees. Uh, are they smiling or are they grumpy? How are they interacting with users? Is it positive or is it negative? What do the surroundings look like? Clean, well tended, or falling apart, so on and so forth. So it really allows you to just spend a few minutes just observing. Uh, I'm a big believer in dressing for success, meaning that you want to have a suit or outfit that you really can't afford uh, in your closet. And the reason why I say that is because ultimately think about it, how often are you going to wear it? And more importantly, what are the, what's the return on investment if it works and you get the position very high? Uh, and certainly that uh, that suit or or outfit that you couldn't afford will pay pay for itself you know three four five six months a year's worth of salary later uh, if you get the position uh, but certainly first impressions are huge and of course you do have to be careful to pay attention to the group that's interview you, interviewing you but in when in doubt always dress overly. Um, uh, conservative uh, or professionally, um, uh, uh, and, and it's best to err on the side of that than to be underdressed. Uh, and again, uh, although it certainly doesn't make you, it usually well, well fitting, expensive clothing uh, is going to fit better. You're going to feel better about yourself, and you're going and you're going to look better uh, uh, to the interview panel. So find a, I guess what I'm saying is find an interview outfit that is much nicer than what you normally would wear. Uh, and again, may represent something uh, that uh, you can't really afford, but at the same time, it goes back to, to raving fans, um, or can you afford not to have it? Uh, I'm also a big believer in bringing something, a nice portfolio or something like that to write on. Not only does it look professional, but certainly it allows you to jot down notes um, as uh, you interview them, uh, or even write down questions. Uh, that they ask you before you answer them, uh, so that it helps you remember uh, what they're what they're asking. Uh, you always want to bring questions for the panel, so questions like um, uh, benefits, uh, questions like professional development, questions like uh, management style, strategic plan, uh, things like that, working conditions, uh, certainly a, um, a tour. Uh, of, of where you would be working is not out of out of the question, things like that. But definitely you want to ask questions. It shows the panel uh, that you've done your homework. And by the way, you should always do your homework on the, and know their website. Uh, and that uh, you are letting them know uh, that it's a two-way street and that you're interviewing them as well. As far as the interview, uh, remember your body language. Again, we talked about this before. Uh, upwards of 90% of your communication is through your body, so be very aware of that. Uh, remember uh, bright smiles, um, firm handshakes, uh, and uh, erect posture, not slouching, uh, and also um, mindful of not allowing your anxiety to turn into scowls. Uh, smile a lot. Make good eye contact a lot.
The other thing is to not complain. Um, <clears throat> it's very easy for us to talk about uh, current situation in our employment or past situation in our employment that's not positive, and that's one of the reasons why we're looking for another job. But ultimately, you want to not complain uh, at all. Um, and the reason for that is uh, several fold. One, uh, certainly uh, uh, prospective employer, employers don't want to hear about uh, how bad your working conditions are because, well, you're essentially putting them down. Um, and two, uh, ultimately, uh, again, people that uh, complain a lot, especially in an interview, which is the honeymoon phase, uh, most likely are going to be complainers uh, when they get there. So, um, <clears throat> so for example, one of the questions that usually is always asked are, are any trouble finding the place? And I don't care whether it took you two hours to find the place. Uh, you don't want to talk about how, yes, it was really hard or the traffic was really bad or the directions weren't quite on. You don't want to complain at all. So um, even if it was a difficult problem, say no problem at all. So in the interview, be sure to relax and be yourself. Remember, a good fit is a good fit. So although you'll be nervous, remember you're interviewing them too. So be yourself. And remember, again, the body language and chit-chat are extremely important. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, a good way, uh, a perfect way for chit-chat is to ask questions and to compliment. Um, those are two things that show that you're positive. Uh, it, it certainly uh, moves it on to, uh, moves the uh, discussion over to them uh, and also allows you to show you're a good listener. And again, uh, you want to do this very cautiously so that you're not just blowing smoke, but uh, asking questions uh, allows you to learn more about the organization uh, and, and certainly compliments such as what a beautiful lobby or you, know, you really like the windows or whatever, whatever. You've heard so many great things about them. You know, those are all things that are great positives uh, and, again, allows them to talk more about their organization, uh, therefore taking some of the heat off of you. Prepare to answer the standard questions first. So tell us about yourself. So again, you want to accentuate the positives and unique aspects of your background through this question, not just, you know, I'm from da da da, the fifth child, and da da da. You want to talk about um, really, again, the positive experiences and particular things that are related to the job, such as you really first fell in love with libraries when you were. You know, you spent uh, every day of the summer, of, uh, uh, of each summer during your youth, you know, again, sharing something that's positive, that's special to you, that, again, reflects well uh, towards the alignment of the position. Your degree, um, obviously, uh, you know, talk about uh, some of the positive experiences there, and then strengths and weaknesses, and that's always a tough one, especially for the weaknesses, uh, but be sure to uh, definitely have a weakness or two, and one that some of the typical ones are sometimes you take on too much uh, or sometimes uh, you work yourself too hard. Uh, those are all uh, negatives that are positive, uh, and so those are all keepers, um, and certainly you don't want to be too honest with some of your weaknesses uh, uh, because, again, that, that's, that, that's shooting yourself in the foot, so to speak. So no, don't go too far there. And have your talent questions already answered so um, uh, you know that uh, there's potential anyway for them to ask uh, for specific examples of how you handled this, that, and the other. Guaranteed, almost, that uh, how you handle conflict and how you uh, well how well you work with others will be a question so go ahead and have that answered uh, of course the answer is well um, uh, and here's how and, and certainly the things that we talked about you may not want to use the concept of raving fans or the term raving fans but you can certainly talk about the concepts of uh, the three secrets of creating uh, you know uh, highly satisfied customers or something like that uh, but being able to speak the lingo of, of our text and, and course concepts I, I always work very well, and I've heard a lot of positive feedback from uh, former students who have used these concepts and, and really, again, the interview panel being very impressed. Um, another common one is creating uh, uh, creative thinking. Uh, in the absence of policy or, or a dilemma, that is what would, what would you do? And certainly handling, handling conflict is another common one.
Again, remember the chit chat during breaks um, or on tour are critical, uh, oftentimes by design. So uh, enjoy yourself and be complimentary, no complaining. Ask lots of questions, listen well. And then the panel questions or questions you want to ask them, certainly um, you can arrange them around the 12 questions, seeking yeses for all of them. So professional development, mentoring, resources, work and break areas, those kind of things. Do they have a mission statement? What is their management philosophy? Now, after the interview, you want to thank them profusely, um, and there are really uh, two ways to send um, notes of thanks. One is uh, by email. I suggest you do that first, um, and the reason for that is because um, ultimately after the interviews are concluded, usually very, very close in close proximity to each other, decisions are made quickly, and an email allows you to, again, ex uh, accentuate uh, your positives to thank them and, and tell them one more time why you think uh, you're a good fit um, and uh, it also uh, will most likely get to them before they've made a final decision um, <clears throat> on the reverse side uh, on, on a number of occasions I've received uh, really nice thank you notes from candidates um, several days after we've already made a decision not to hire them uh, and, and although it's well received uh, really, I guess the impact um, it has is, of course, very nominal. Uh, and so certainly on one hand it's very classy of them, but usually the, the interview panel spends very little time uh, really uh, relishing the thank you note because, you know, they've already moved on uh, and so it has very minimal impact. So um, email immediately after the interview. That way you can get to them hopefully before they made a final decision. Um, and uh, it allows you to accentuate uh, why you think you're such a great fit for the job or a perfect fit for the job in the organization. And then if you want to also follow up with a manual thank you note, uh, that's great. Obviously, if you got the job, it, it, they will really appreciate that. And again, just continue um, developing a positive relationship with them. And if you are not offered the job, you still are showing your sincerest thanks. Okay, in terms of firing, why would you? Well, the first uh, is that culture is very important. So if the person is not fitting in the culture, whatever that means, uh, or is um, disrupting the culture in a, in a direct, strategic way, uh, that, and that is a cause for concern. The next is violating the non-negotiables, and those are HR policies that really are non-negotiable, so vacation and leave time, um, consistently not being on time or late, harassment of others, demeanor that's completely inappropriate, dress that's completely inappropriate, and of course anything illegal. Those are all non-negotiables that are cause for immediate uh, firing. And then if they're having personality conflicts across the board, so those individuals that just are not meshing um, or are causing conflict and after talking to them uh, it's not resolved, that, that's a, certainly a major issue because they're not only a problem for themselves but they're impacting performance for other people. And of course performance, um, based on your performance measurements, they're consistently underperforming that's certainly a big cause for concern. And in general, I call it the three strikes rule. That is, if an employee um, is having issues, that causes me and the management team to have to get, get together to talk about that person for more than three times, then that's a huge problem. Um, if you think about it, uh, or in an action needs to take place, you can imagine um, taking uh, supervisors and managers off the floor to gather to discuss a particular individual's poor performance more than three times is not only just very disruptive but also very expensive so uh, and again taking management away from other employees uh, and doing the things that uh, like manage by walking around that should be done so really uh, an organization can't can't afford to have individuals 
go beyond much further beyond the three strikes, uh, especially um, because it, it's just it's going to bring the entire organization down. So I call it three strikes. Again, that's just a rule of thumb. But ultimately, if in the end the management team has to get together to discuss poor performance of a specific individual three times or more, then certainly direct action needs to take place. Now, that direct action doesn't have to be firing. Certainly, you want to try finding a good fit first, even though you do want to keep records and dates and instances of poor, of poor performance, customer complaints, so on and so forth. <clears throat> certainly you also want to try working around their weaknesses so again poor performance ultimately initially is is aligned to or directly linked to management so um, finding ways around the problems also are a good way to go and then also remember first break all the rules quote on performance which is that in fact poor performance looks like average performance with no trend upward no apparent trend upward. So um, keep that in mind because that, that really is a way to prevent um, poor performance. Um, and really poor performance, meaning that those that are average performers with no trend upwards um, are in a potential um, burnout situation or uh, in, a, in essence, if they're not going up, they're going to be going down uh, quickly or they're going to be going down soon. So identifying individuals like that uh, would certainly help potentially prevent them from burning out and performing really poorly. So as far as uh, um, annual performances, one of the reasons why annual performance need, need to be completely uh, candid and honest as opposed to um, afraid to hurt somebody's feelings. Uh, so for example, if someone, if you were interested in terminating someone, yet their annual performance said they were excellent, uh, and, and uh, then you you have an issue. You have a problem where um, <clears throat> uh, they can say that they were not given any warning uh, and uh, no opportunities for improvement were identified, and so it's very difficult to terminate someone with uh, an annual, va uh, annual valuation the year before or consecutively that uh, show otherwise. So you want to use your evaluations to be honest and candid um, regarding strengths and opportunities for improvement. Uh, if you have good documentation and data and have communicated frequently with the person, then um, being fired will not be a surprise. Uh, and I have yet to be in a, a firing. Unfortunately, I've had to do it a number of times. Um, not too many, probably three or four, uh, but ultimately um, none of them were acrimonious. It was more of a relief because it had been a long process uh, and it was clear to both sides that it was not a good fit. Um, so um, something else you can do with the individual is allow them an opportunity to quit. Um, so uh, that saves face for the, or the person. Uh, and uh, also um, allows them, again, to take some autonomy uh, in, in, in the situation as far as walking away. Um, also, all positions are not created equally. So, for example, those that are in IT positions oftentimes get fired um, or removed from job duties uh, abruptly, and that's because of their power. Uh, over the network uh, and the technology, uh, and so those individuals are handled a little differently. And you do want to be aware of that, so be careful of the individuals that you're dealing with as far as their role in the organization and the potential for uh, causing damage uh, if, if uh, they wanted to. <clears throat> I've also found that you can't save, I would say, actually anyone. Um, uh, every time I've tried to save individuals, that is, I, I hired them because I thought they'd earned the opportunity, even though I wasn't sure, or um, I tried to keep them on because um, I knew they had a lot of bad breaks. Uh, it never works. Uh, and the reason for that is because ultimately those that are performing poorly um, have issues usually that are outside of your control. That's after you've tried, of course, to help. Uh, improve the situation, but if none of those work, ultimately they're, you're dealing with things that are out of your control. So, for example, 
uh, one individual had an issue of alcoholism. Well, there's nothing really you can do about that. Obviously, you can guide them to some help, but if they can't uh, control that, then, then that's not on you. Uh, that's on them. So ultimately, people that really do poorly after you've tried a number of things uh, are out of control in their own lives um, and or just such a poor fit for the job, and that is they don't like it uh, or not good at it or both usually, uh, then uh, really trying to save somebody is not going to do it. Now, I say that because ultimately when you hire someone, again, that's why you don't want to hire them on a single, a single variable. Uh, that is you want to give them a shot or you know they're from your hometown or or they need a break or anything like that. Those are all poor choices, poor variables to make a choice on hiring because ultimately it usually will not work. Another thing is that when you're building the case to fire someone, you do not want to talk bad about that individual for other coworkers. Certainly, as a manager, you're trying to build the case or understand their performance, uh, but you must be very careful um, uh, to not talk badly about that individual. And, and I say that because it's exceedingly hard at times because you're frustrated with the person, uh, but you cannot talk bad about them. Now, it is okay to have a confidant. Um, uh, you know, your boss or someone that's not your equal. So it's got to be uh, someone above you or someone outside the organization that you can complain to about a person that's not doing well. Uh, so that's a good way to do it. Um, and uh, <clears throat> still not say you should talk bad about the person, but it allows you to vent a little bit more openly uh, without uh, uh, you know, hurting that person uh, in the eyes of someone that will be working with them. All right, and if you're considering firing, then you should always consult HR first. And you should also make sure that they're present. So uh, just in case the firing does not go well, you have a third, party, part, uh, third person party there who has a lot of experience and can observe and, and ensure that you're protected and the individual is protected as well. Uh, you definitely want to have all of your documentation just in case there are any questions or concerns. Um, uh, you have all of the data there that shows why you're making the decision. Um, usually there's two weeks notice or reassignment or, or leave with pay. Those are all different options. So if uh, you, you want to fire the person uh, but not make it effective until two weeks after uh, from that date, then that's a good way again for them to save face where you can pay for them just to leave. Um, and uh, and, and and uh, just you know, kind of sever it that way, uh, or you can reassign them in the organization. Um, but anyway, you certainly want to give them notice if possible. Uh, if they're not in positions of uh, power that can compromise the the organization, or, or as long as you feel that it's not that acrimonious, uh, those are all potential options. If you feel it could be acrimonious, then leave with pay uh, is is also an option. Um, in the end, again, uh, having let fire, have, having fired some people before, uh, you really want to talk about the rationale and the performance and using uh, the data to demonstrate it's not a good fit. And again, usually that's not, actually I've never really had to do that. Uh, ultimately, they know it already, uh, and the good fit part is really the key. Uh, again, a lot of people like that get fired say that in fact it's the best thing that ever happened to them. In the, in the end because they, that forces them to get out of their rut and go find something they really do enjoy uh, doing. And certainly that's a tack that, that should be taken if you have to fire somebody, uh, even going as far as helping them with resources or suggestions as far as ways uh, to pursue areas that might be a better fit for them because it's demonstrating that you do care and respect them as individuals uh, and you do regret uh, having to fire them and you do want them to be successful in life. Okay, and then I want to conclude this week's lecture with um, a look, taking a close look at yourself, and that's when should you look for another job. So remember Maslow's hierarchy. Um, not so much in this class, but certainly in previous classes, I've had folks that have not been in good working uh, situations, uh, and what that means is that again, remember Maslow's hierarchy. Um, uh, are you overwhelmed and overworked? Uh, do you have um, uh, the things that you need um, is is the job a good fit for what you need? 
So one, it should be a safe, secure work environment, free from harassment, uh, free from uh, fear of physical or emotional uh, abuse or, or danger. Uh, it should be something that nurtures your self-esteem and sense of industriousness. That means you feel good about it. You feel like it's a good fit. You feel like you're making a difference and you feel good about yourself for that. And again, remember, first break all the rules definition of performance. That certainly applies to you as well. That is, uh, are you trending upward uh, or are you um, static? And then also remember the concept of learned helplessness, which actually I don't think we've talked about. But again, uh, learned helplessness is all about, um, or is derived from Pavlov's um, very controversial and really painful research with dogs, where what he did is he he uh, um, <clears throat> essentially put a dog on a, a floor with an electric shock, uh, and uh, the first round of experiments allowed them to jump over a net or over a little barrier to get away from the shock and so every time he turned on the shock they would immediately jump over the barrier uh, and then be fine uh, and then he, the experiment uh, was uh, then not allowing them or raising the barrier so the dog could not jump and ultimately after a few shocks the dog would just sit there uh, and, and just take the shock without with no whining or anything else uh, and that's what that term became was called learned helplessness, where one just gives up. So you be sh be careful that you're not doing that, that you're just not accepting a bad situation, shrugging your shoulders, and falling into a learned helplessness position uh, where you're just taking it, uh, because in the end, uh, that uh, most likely is leading you down a path towards burnout. Now remember, what what is the... Why is burnout so bad? Well, clearly it's not good for anyone. It's not good for you physically or emotionally, but it's also not good for your future references and relationships with coworkers. So, again, uh, think of it this way. you uh, old Ideally, you want to leave the position that you're in uh, before you burn out uh, while your references and while your relationships with your coworkers are intact and while they were willing to say nice things about you. But if you burn out, uh, ultimately you can compromise those and really put yourself in a tough situation. So be very careful uh, on, uh, on all fronts uh, about not burning out. Uh, and certainly management usually is a primary player uh, in that uh, position. And so um, you want to uh, assess whether you think management might actually turn over uh, or change in the future because certainly when that uh, does happen uh, the culture of the organization has the potential to change um, very uh, significantly so you want to weigh that in if you're in a bad situation and then ask yourself the 12 questions how many of those can you answer yes versus no it's a good assessment as far as your your current situation And then also, where does this position lie in the grander scheme of things? So do you plan on being there forever, uh, or is this a stepping stone uh, towards something else? So that certainly can provide you some hope as far as where, where your current job that's not going well fits in all those. And it's always good to look around from time to time, even if you're not dissatisfied for your job, uh, so that... Uh, uh, if something better is out there that's a better fit, it's always a lot easier to find it uh, with little, no pressure uh, than it is uh, if you don't have a position or you're, you really need to get out quickly. So um, if if your job is, uh, or if you're kind of in that first break of rule situation where you're not really feeling like you're trending upward and you may be, uh, you may have become overqualified for your job where you, you do need something new. So looking around from time to time is not a bad idea because uh, uh, ultimately you may find something that's a much better fit for you. And again, with low pressure uh, and not with, with no desperation. The other uh, philosophy is be active and be seen. Um, I find that when you're doing really good work, uh, people come to you for positions, uh, and uh, that's usually how it works um, for those that do very well. So be seen, be heard, do good work, and oftentimes you'll be offered a job uh, straight out of the blue. 
uh, meaning that you're not looking, but the phone rings and someone actually encourages you to apply, especially those that end up in management positions. That happens very frequently uh, where they're recruited by other, other organizations because of their excellence uh, their, uh, of work. Uh, and again, you know you've really um, reached a different level in your career uh, when that happens. Uh, and let me tell you a quick story about uh, something like that for me. Um, that ultimately did not work out. Um, I was called by the CEO, CIO um, of Florida State uh, and offered um, uh, or asked to apply for the position of Director of Technology for Florida State. Um, and I was, a, I was a faculty member uh, at Florida State at the time. Uh, and I accepted that offer. Uh, and, of course, I, I had not done it. basically worked with them on on the job description and worked with them on uh, how long it was going to be advertised for uh, and really was the inside candidate um, and uh, <clears throat> again it was a wonderful opportunity wonderful job uh, that uh, you know would have been over a tremendous amount of responsibility uh, but uh, what ended up happening is it not it did not work out because one of the external candidates uh, was outstanding uh, or actually really another inside candidate, to be honest, uh, that, that decided uh, to apply for the position. Uh, and this individual was much better suited for the job in the end because one of my problems was whether to go into uh, administration and operations or to continue uh, along the path of uh, being a faculty member, which involves teaching, instruction, research, and service. Uh, and I think the um, in the end, it was clear to me and to the interview panel that ultimately my heart was more uh, on uh, in, in academia in the research and teaching as opposed to operations, um, strictly operations. So, uh, but the bottom line is uh, because I had been doing good work at Florida State, uh, passionate about technology and user services in particular, um, a wonderful job opportunity was offered to me, but in the end, uh, I didn't get it. I didn't get the position. I was one of the finest, but I did not get the position, uh, which at first I kind of beat myself up over because I felt I had blown it. But ultimately, in retrospect, I realized that it was it was actually the per perfect thing to happen for me, because again, I really my heart wasn't 100% behind the idea of leaving academia uh, as a faculty member. Uh, but again, the point being is if you do really good work, oftentimes doors will be open for you uh, privately uh, and uh, you'll get job offers that uh, ultimately uh, you, you are not, uh, other people will not have the opportunity to do. And then also remember, too, this scary or, or happy thought, depending how you look at it, we spend most of our waking hours at work. So um, that's why do you have a best friend at work is important. Uh, and that's why it's important that you are deriving meaningful satisfaction from a personal level and a professional level because you, most of your waking hours will be spent at work. Uh, and you want those to be enjoyable, meaningful, and beneficial to yourself. Okay, so in conclusion, I uh, wanted to just review the weekly team calendar. So we're in week 13, hard to believe. Uh, but uh, you want to be collecting data for sure and, go, and going ahead and analyzing it um, as well. So uh, in, uh, as other groups have already done, you, you should definitely have somebody writing sections that don't require um, uh, the final analyzed data. So certainly the introduction, the methods, uh, um, you know, anything else that you can do uh, without the data would be uh, important. Preliminary recommendations uh, also can be written up uh, if you have some data points to, to talk about. So uh, week 13, so we are um, two and a half weeks really removed from the, uh, the final assignment. So uh, please um, uh, continue working on that and let me know if you have any questions. And as far as the group work for this week, I will want you to work on uh, three scenarios. <clears throat> the first one is uh, you recently graduated with your degree and your first job, and you, you were given this really nice computer. Um, <clears throat> but uh, you notice that most many of the existing um, employees have old computers. Um, so what might you suggest to the organization about a possible revision of the computer replacement policy? 
Um, scenario two is you've been receiving frequent complaints about patron from patrons about homeless people who smell really badly. What should you do? Uh, is, should there be some kind of policy that can be enforced to ensure that uh, librarians throughout the organization are handling that situation consistently? And the third scenario I want you to respond to is you received $75,000 to purchase 50 new computers. Um, and if you assume licenses for each unit is $200 per unit per year, how much actual budget will you need to maintain and replace all 50 computers in three years? Uh, and what does this say about your computer budgeting? So that is an Excel problem, so certainly use your budget sheet from assignment two to look at that. But I want you to address all three of these. Um, uh, give me your thoughts as far as how to apply much of what you've learned in the semester to these three. Uh, and then, of course, respond accordingly to uh, one of your uh, teammates. Okay, that's it for this week. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, next week, we'll go into cover letters and resumes talk about uh, a professional development plan. It's one of the things that faculty feedback as far as the capstones have said uh, we need to improve on. So I'm going to spend some time talking about putting together a professional development plan. And then we'll also next we talk about your final management treaties, uh, which is your individual last final assignment, as well as evaluations and um, how that will go. So thanks for tuning in. Have a great week, and uh, let me know if you have any questions. Uh, also, um, as far as uh, the Illuminate session, uh, I have moved that to uh, 7 to 8 on Thursdays, so more people can potentially attend. So feel free to uh, attend that session if you would like to discuss uh, uh, anything with me uh, in, in, in person or uh, synchronously anyway. All right, take care.